All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Thank you. The book of Daniel says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonied, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. That's from the third chapter of Daniel. The fourth man in the fiery furnace is the consciousness of God, the awareness of the living Spirit Almighty within you. It means you're in an exalted state of mind, you're in tune with the infinite. The ancient scripture says, Water wets it not, fire burns it not, wind blows it not away, and swords pierce it not. When man is in a certain state of mind, a higher spiritual dimension, fire does not burn him, and poisons do not kill. F. L. Rawson, the great uh, English electrical scientist, wrote in Scientific Prayer about an experience of one of his associates, who in a clairvoyant vision saw an airplane come out of the clouds in flames. It burned out about a hundred feet from the ground, then cracked and fell. She knew this was going to take place. She knew the place and the time. She looked about to see what the men were like, and she couldn't distinguish anything about them. They were burnt to a cinder. She went to the house of a friend which overlooked the field. At half past two, she asked the lady of the house to come up and help her. The, the two stood there praying. Suddenly the airplane, which she saw in a clairvoyant vision, came out aflame. It burned and cracked, just as she had seen in her vision. There were two men in it, and they were absolutely untouched. It was like the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not even singed. One of them said, I was about to throw myself out, when suddenly a sense of absolute peace and safety came, and I sat back in the machine. There he was in a furnace. That man turned out to be the son of the lady she had asked to come up and help her. There are many such cases recorded all over the world. The three men mentioned in Daniel represent faith, love, and understanding. Faith, of course, means your definite belief that there is a response from infinite intelligence when you call upon it. Love in the Bible means allegiance, loyalty, and devotion to the one power, for there is only one power, I am, and there is none else. Recognizing no other cause, and positively refusing to give power to any person, place, or thing, or any created thing in the universe. In other words, you put the Creator first in your life. That's called love in the Bible. Understanding means you stand on your confidence, trust, and insight into the working of the law. Knowing whatever you believe in your heart will come to pass. The fourth way to pray is to contemplate the presence of God, the infinite within you. There cannot be two infinite. Infinity cannot be divided or multiplied. The two women mentioned by Rawson prayed by practicing the presence of God where the plane was. In other words, they contemplated the presence of love, peace, harmony, beauty, and divine right action. And in their minds and hearts, heart, immersed these men in the holy omnipresence, bathed by the light of God, and they succeeded in saving their life. Had they had a hundred percent realization, which means to make it real, they could have saved the plane also. Joseph Chilton Pierce, a research scholar in his writings, states that in Surrey, England, 1935-1936, the English Society for Psychical Research ran a series of tests on two Indian fakers imported expressly for the purpose. The tests were graded by physicians, chemists, physicists, and psychologists of Oxford and Cambridge. The Indians walked the fire under controlled conditions, under the skeptical and probing eyes of science itself. 
No chemicals were used, no preparations made. They repeated the performances under a variety of conditions and over a period of several weeks on demand. Surface temperatures were between 450 and 500 degrees centigrade. The interior temperature was 1400 degrees centigrade. There was no trickery or hallucination. Mr. Pierce pointed out that a high point was reached when one of the fakers noticed a professor of psychology avidly intrigued and dumbfounded. The faker, sensing the longing, told the good professor he too could walk the fire if he so desired, by holding the faker's hand. The good man was seized with faith that he could, that he could. He shed his shoes, and hand in hand they walked the fire, ecstatic and unharmed. You see, faith is an attitude of mind. It's a way of thinking. It's faith in the creative power, the one power that responds to you when you call upon it. All of us know fire burns, but when man tunes in with the infinite and reaches a high state of consciousness, he is immune. Neither does cancer have to kill a person if he decides to ascend in consciousness and definitely believes he will be healed. In the Psychic Digest a few years ago, there appeared the following article, and I quote, Not many people know that Virginia Graham's success in her famous TV girl talk show came after she licked terminal cancer and made medical history. Her doctor explained the miracle. He said Virginia experienced in these words, she purified her bloodstream with her thoughts, the doctor said. Actually, this came about as a result of Virginia's fervent prayers when she knew she would be healed and would live. I have a surviving point of view, she claims. I am not interested in sinking or floating. This love of life communicates itself and is probably one of the reasons for her new TV show, climbing to the top. It is true, of course, many die of terminal cancer, but she decided to believe in another way and established a new construct in her mind, an altered state of consciousness brought about the healing. You may have a wonderful knowledge of science, philosophy, and be devoutly religious, but all these three fail time and time again to solve the problems of men and women in this world. All of us should turn to the supreme intelligence within, the self-originating spirit, and let that presence and power coordinate all our activities and direct our lives to ways of pleasantness and paths of peace. Lindbergh had a wonderful knowledge of science, philosophy, was deeply religious also, but the fourth way of prayer saved his life. He flew across the Atlantic Ocean without a co-pilot, radio, or parachute, guided only by a compass. He fell asleep on the plane, asleep with his eyes wide open, and experienced the functioning of the higher powers within him, ruling, governing, and controlling his mind and body, which directed the flight and prodded him to activity when necessary. Lindbergh, in this state, where his conscious reasoning mind was suspended in sleep, became aware of vague, transparent forms riding with him. He said, My skull is one great eye. These fourth-dimensional beings had forms. They were phantom-like, were very friendly. They spoke with human qualities and gave him rare information on navigation and reassured and comforted him all the way. Yet he was sound asleep. He couldn't keep his log. He was immobilized. Yet the fourth way took over. These friendly people had no rigid bodies, yet they remained human and outline form. Lindbergh was unable to keep his log or focus his attention on his roof. 
Yet when he awakened, he sighted Ireland. It was only a few miles off his course. He had a fourth-dimensional experience. Yes, which saved his life. That's the fourth way to pray. Learn all the science you can. It's very important. Get a good philosophy of life that gives you poise, balance, serenity, and tranquility. Get a religion that you believe in. A religion should give you joy and happiness, peace of mind and security. Remember, you must demonstrate what you believe. But when you meet with some great difficulty or challenge, and you find that all you know and believe does not solve it, turn to the divine presence within you, that absolute being, the living Spirit Almighty. Knowing in your heart that it is all wise, omnipotent, supreme, omniscient. It knows only the answer, and before you call, the answer is there. It's the ever-living one, the all-wise one, the all-knowing one, the self-renewing one, the self-perpetuating one. Job had three friends, which could be called in his day creed, dogma, and tradition. Their blatant iniquitous and mordant mouthings were repulsive to Job. They told Job he was guilty of sins for which he deserved his fate. Frightful thing to say to a man when he's sick, isn't it? Eliphaz, Eliphaz said to Job, Is not thy wickedness great, and thine iniquities infinite? Job replies, I have heard many such things, miserable comforters are ye all. When Elihu comes, Job begins to feel mentally and spiritually the presence of God and he is restored to his former glory. For Elihu means God in man, man awakening to the presence and power of God within him. Job no longer listens to the tiresome and bombastic fulminations of his former comforters, which were false beliefs and opinions, because he has now awakened to the truth of his own being, that God indwells him, and that God never punishes, God cannot judge. All judgment is given to the Son, which is your own mind. So man condemns himself. Job realized he was not a victim of punishment, vengeance, or karma, but of ignorance. He realized ignorance was the only sin, and all the suffering and punishment was the result of that ignorance. He came out into the light, love and freedom of the Spirit, into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. The so-called wise men of the day could not solve Job's problems or give him adequate answers to his question. Elihu means man's awakening to the God presence within. This is why Job says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, for all these things passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Eddie Rickenbacker was adrift on a rafter in the ocean. He called on the universal presence and power, and a gull came on his shoulder for food, and also rain came to quench his thirst. He was protected and rescued in divine order. Religion, philosophy, his religious beliefs, his philosophy, and his science didn't save him. But when he called on that universal presence and power, which is omnipresent, and ever present help in time of trouble, it responded to him. The fourth way takes in all the knowledge of science, philosophy, and religion, plus an awareness and exalted recognition of the presence of God in man. Science is constantly changing. Some years ago, the late Robert Millikan of California Institute of Technology pointed out that the dogma of immutable elements is gone. It went with the discovery of radioactivity, Today we are dealing with a universe of densities, frequencies, and intensities. It is a changing, evolving, dynamic, living universe. Everything in the universe is alive. Oh yes, different degrees of aliveness or livingness. Different degrees of intelligence. So the more in intelligence that is resurrected in man, the greater measure of freedom does he have. Marconi, you know, decided to, uh, said he was going to light up the world or send a thought around the world. Edison decided to light up the world. 
You know what his relatives did to Marconi? They put him in a straitjacket for six weeks. They said he was insane, that he was psychotic. Uh, yet, nevertheless, the thought goes around the whole world, doesn't it? Edison was sent home from school. They said he was stupid and dumb. They couldn't learn. Other boys were laughing at him. He was disturbing the class. But his mother, and Edison himself, didn't think so. He decided to light up the world, and he did. Brought forth thousands of inventions. He said one time he never invented anything. The ideas came to him from the depths of his own mind, and he nourished and sustained them. And the way opened up. So uh, these are interesting things. Ford, you know, they laughed at him too. And Ford decided to put the world on wheels. But he was laughed at. Uh, so his father comes along and he said, Winter isn't far away, boats will be few, and the surface fish will be swimming deep. He said, son, if you must study, then study food, how to get it. This flying business is all very well, but you can't eat a glide. You know, don't you forget that the reason you fly is to eat. This is what the father says to him. Jonathan nodded obediently. For the next few days, he tried to behave like the other gull, the way his parents wanted him to act, screechy and fighting, diving in old scraps of fish and bread, but he couldn't make it work. It's all so silly, he said, so pointless. It's nonsense. A uh, hungry gull chasing one another. He said, I could be spending all the time learning to fly. There's so much to learn. This is what he said. You know, there is no end to the glory which is man. Ever onward, upward, and Godward, the God presence is within you. I said, ye are gods and all ye sons of the Most High. But millions of people think they're like worms of the dust, you know. If you think you're a worm, everybody's going to step on you. Everybody's going to kick you around, too. You're not a worm. You're a daughter of the infinite. You're a child of eternity. And God is your father and your mother, too. Uh, so you're here to rise, transcend, and grow. You're not here to conform. A teacher... You know, has some boys and girls in the class. Well, one of them might be an Einstein. Another might be a Carver. Another one might be a, an Edison or a George Washington or a Lincoln. Why should they conform? Conformity is not the way to life. We're all different. We're all unique. They're, you don't have the same worlds on your finger, or the same toe prints, same glandular system, the same ideas, the same dreams or aspirations. There's n you're entirely different than any other person in the world. You're unique, for God never repeats himself. Why on earth should you conform? <clears throat> uh, a lot of people go to church, they want to be seen, you know, there. They say, oh, this is the thing to do. I said to one man, I said, do you believe in that? He said, not a word of it. But uh, he said, it's the place to be seen. Well, of course, that's hypocrisy. And, of course, all that does is bring you, give you a complex. Like the man listening to... Adam and Eve, the first parents. I said, do you believe that? He said, no, I give lip service to it. That creates a conflict. To don't believe anything that you do, that your conscious and subconscious do not agree with. And furthermore, don't believe a lie. And don't believe anything that insults your intelligence. Put it on the shelf and say, I don't quite understand that now, but the spirit of truth in me reveals to me all truth, and the answer will come to you. Anyhow, the subject was speed, and in a week's practice, Jonathan learned more about speed than the fastest gull alive. Uh, <clears throat> he also lost control at higher speeds. Climb to a thousand feet, yes, he was able to do that too. He was able to go 70 miles an hour. And the key, he thought at last, must be to hold the wings still at high speeds, to flap up to 50 and then hold the wings still. It took tremendous strength, but it worked. In ten seconds, he had blurred through ninety miles an hour. Now he's gaining all the time. Jonathan had set a world speed record for seagulls. Uh, well, he's trying, you see. And as you keep on trying, he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. The men who went back tried to get to the moon. They had many setbacks, but the vision was on the moon. And, of course, they went. They had to go where their vision was. And uh, so these uh, failures were, as I said, stepping stones to their triumph and the joys in overcoming. That's the way you shock your mental and spiritual tools, you know. That's the way you get ahead in life. And uh, so uh, the man who has some setbacks, he does look upon them as failures. Not at all. Now he said, you know, he had some trouble in the air. 
Uh, his wings were ragged bars of lead, he said, but the weight of failure was even heavier on his back. He wished feebly that the weight could be just enough to drag him gently down to the bottom and end it all. Well, there are people, you know, when uh, they get setbacks, you know, husband leaves or the wife leaves or something, runs off with another man. Uh, they want to end it all, you know. You've heard that, I suppose. Despair, you know. What's the use? I'm at the end of my rope. I have a suicidal complex and all that. There's only one way to go, and that's to rise. Turn your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. And the hills, of course, represent the God presence within, the supreme intelligence and absolute power. A suicidal person with a suicidal complex is looking for a solution. They want freedom. That's all they want. And if you jump off a bridge, you solve no problem. You're earthbound. You're in a daze. And you don't solve any problem by running off to Boston, you know. You carry your mind with you. And the problem is in your mind, and that's where you solve it. You're not your body, as he brings out in this book over and over again. You're a transcendental being. You're not limited by your body. You have bodies to infinity. You can't, you can't even conceive of yourself without a body, you know. Uh, so, um, he said, if I were meant to fly at speed, I'd have Falcon's short wings. I'd live on mice instead of fish. His father was right, he said. I must forget this foolishness. I must fly home to the flock and be content, just a poor, limited seagull. Have you ever said that to yourself? I must be one of the herd. I must be one of the family. I mustn't be different, you know. I must comb my hair the same way. Uh, no, he thought, I am done with the way I was. I am done with everything I learned. I am a seagull like every other seagull, and I will, like, I will fly like one. So he climbed painfully to a hundred feet, flapped his wings. He felt better for his decision to be just another one of the flock. There would be no old ties now to the force that had driven him to learn. The hollow voice inside, you know, there's always that voice in you saying to you, Rise, come on up higher, I have need of you, for life is always seeking expression through you. If a man is drunk in the gutter, there's a voice telling him, Rise, transcend, grow, come on up higher. It never leaves him, it never forsakes him. It's the God present seeking expression. And he said, the voice said to him, Seagulls never fly in the dark. Um... Seagulls never fly in the dark, he said to himself. If you were meant to fly in the dark, you'd have the eyes of an owl. You'd have charts for brains. You'd have a falcon's short wings. There in the night, a hundred feet in the air, Jonathan Livingston Seagull blinked. His resolutions vanished. The Bible says, you know, I will lead the blind in a way they know not. I will lead them in paths they have not known. Millions are blind. They're blind to the fact that thought, your thought is creative. Every thought is incipient action. What you feel, you attract, what you imagine you become. Any idea, emotional life, good or bad, that you, that you impregnate your subconscious with comes to pass as form, function, experience, and event. There's a supreme intelligence within you which men call God. It responds to your thought. Millions do not know that. They're rejected. It's up in the sky somewhere. And uh, therefore, we're told in the Bible, is despised and rejected the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Who is it talking about? The average man who rejects this God presence and the truths about it. So he said, a falcon short wing, that's the answer. What a fool I've been, he said. All I need is a tiny little wing. All I need is to fold most of my wings and fly in just the tips, short wings. The wind was a monster roller to set, 70 miles per hour, 90, 120, and faster still. Oh yes, he's getting faster all the time. His vows of a moment will go, that is, listening to his parents, were forgotten. Swept away in that great swift wind. Wind mean the Bible, you know, the spirit within. Yet he felt guiltless, breaking the promises he had made himself. Such promises are only for the gulls that accept the ordinary. One who has touched excellence in his learning has no need of that kind of promise. <clears throat> a bad promise is better broken than kept. Don't ever keep a bad promise. And if the, uh, your marriage is hopeless, and if two of you are always fighting and quarreling, it's better to break up the lie than live the lie. There are some cases that are absolutely hopeless, where they're irreconcilable, you know. Uh, and it takes two to make a go of marriage, you know. And it's 100%, not 50-50. And when you see God in each other, 
and uh, salute the divinity in each other and exalt the God presence and rejoice in the happiness and the peace and the harmony of each other, then, of course, the marriage grows more blessed through the years. But where two are fighting and quarreling and resenting each other, they're already divorced. And I've talked to people who are divorced for 50 years, but they're living together. They're divorced from harmony, beauty, love, peace, kindness, goodwill, all these things, divorced completely from their marriage vows. And, of course, then comes sickness, all manner of diseases, malignant growths, and what have you. Um, better break a bad promise, yes. Don't compromise with evil. Don't compromise with anything negative. Insist on divine right action. Insist on the best, and the best will come to you. Always take the best, and the best remains. Never accept the second best. So one who has touched excellence, he said, has no need of these bad promises, for there is nothing too good to be true, nothing too wonderful to last, for the love, the light, and the glory of the infinite are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, and there is nothing too um, too good to be true. If you say, oh, it's too good to be true, you're saying that. You're making a law for yourself, and to you it doesn't happen. It happens to the person down the street. If you say it can't last, what can't last? Love is ageless and timeless, so is peace, so is abundance, security, inspiration. The truths of God are timeless and ageless and changeless and eternal. Uh, if you say it can't last, that's what you're saying. That's a law you're making to yourself, and for you, it can't last. Um, so he finally had reached terminal velocity. The wind was a solid beating wall of sound against which he could move no faster. He's going at 214 miles an hour. That's enormous speed for a bird. And uh, he said, Jonathan Livingston Siegel fired directly through the center of the breakfast flock, ticking off 212 miles an hour, eyes closed. The gull of fortune smiled upon him. And it was wonderful. Terminal velocity, Siegel at 214 miles per hour. This, Jonathan said, is a great breakthrough. It was a breakthrough, the greatest single moment in the history of the flock. And in that moment, a new age opened for Jonathan Gull. Uh, a single wing, wingtip feather, he found, moved a fraction of an inch, give, give, giving him a smooth, sweeping curve at tremendous speed. Now he's entering the higher dimensions of mind. He becomes a spiritual paratrooper. And when you pray, you become a spiritual paratrooper because you fly above the problem or difficulty to the haven of rest, to the God presence within, the secret place where you walk and talk with God. And there you contemplate the way it is in God and heaven, meaning the spirit within you. Heaven is the infinite intelligence within you, the infinite mind, infinite power in which you live and move and have your being. You are in heaven now. That's where you live. You are a spirit now. And therefore, as you contemplate the all-wise one, boundless love, infinite intelligence, absolute harmony, and the infinite wisdom, and realizing but the answer is there, and you contemplate the divine solution, the happy ending, you knowing in your heart and soul the almighty power will respond to you. Then the day will break for you, and all the shadows will flee away. That's why you become a spiritual paratrooper. You never dwell on the problem. You detach your mind from the problem altogether. You contemplate the solution, the way things ought to be, the wholeness, the beauty, and the perfection of the infinite. Never once do you dwell upon the problem, only on the answer, the solution, the way out. The two fundamental principles, conservation of mass and conservation of energy, are now gone as distinct and separable verities. Robert Milliken of California Institute of Technology pointed that out some years ago. Einstein said that matter was energy reduced to the point of visibility. Energy is a term used by scientists for spirit or God. Today, energy and mass are interconvertible and interchangeable. Medicine is rapidly changing. A few weeks ago, I read an article by Dr. Rubenstein of UCLA, who was in the Times, and he said that the medicine of 10 years ago was completely outmoded due to a rapid advance in science and technology, and that the doctor practicing according to standards of 1950 is completely out of date and may be dangerous. Chemistry and physics are rapidly undergoing a transformation so much so that the textbooks of a few years ago are out of date now. Religion is changing all over the world. 
Dogmatism means to assert something without knowledge. It's to assert something which every high school boy knows is false, such as the six days of creation and God rested on the seventh, and Adam and Eve are first parents in the Garden of Eden. All that is utter nonsense. The Garden of Eden is your own subconscious mind. Adam and Eve is your conscious and subconscious mind. And the harmonious interaction of your conscious and subconscious mind bring forth health, happiness, peace, abundance, and security. Dogmatism is the attitude of a closed mind. It is foolish to talk about the six days of creation or the rotation of the sun about the earth. They believe the earth was flat, you know, at one time. Some people still do. The tree of life is the living presence almighty within you. The tree of good and evil represent good and bad thoughts. Our ideas, which like a tree, become fixed and grow up into opinions, fixations, prejudices, fears. The good ideas grow up too such as the belief in the golden rule, the law of love and kindness and honesty and integrity. So the good and evil are within ourselves, you know. So the tree of life and the tree of good and evil are within all of us. Voltaire said if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Science has made wonderful strides and has been a great boon and blessing to mankind. In ancient times in Europe, when a plague hit a city, the priest would carry the host in a procession, pour holy water on the streets and people. I said to the audience on Sunday morning that holy water was water you boil hell out of. So there isn't any such thing as holy water. Water is just H2O. It's the same water in Lourdes. It's in your tap, you know. There's no difference. Science came along and introduced sanitation hygiene and saved countless lives. Lister, Pasteur, and other research men, through their discoveries, caused doctors to adopt sterilization procedures in hospitals, thereby saving countless lives. Prior to that, people died like flies in the hospital table. Uh, we have had wonderful philosophers, such as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Tagore, Emerson, Willem James, Kant, Plotinus, Eckhart, and many, many others. They have set forth marvelous uh, truths, but philosophy is not of much use except we put it into practice. Down through the ages we've had frightful religious wars. Philosophers have argued among themselves, and science has not been able to solve the problems of the world. Each one is necessary and useful, but all three, science, philosophy, and religion, such as creed, dogma, and tradition, have failed miserably in bringing peace to the troubled mind. We've had wars down through the ages. We'll continue to have them as long as man is what he is, until man awakens to the presence and power of God within him and realize three and a half billion people in this world are simply extensions of himself, that there's only one mind. And then he realizes that whatever he wishes or thinks about another, he is creating in his own mind, body, and pocketbook and circumstance. Then when he awakens to that simple, simple truth, then he will pour forth his benedictions on all mankind. He won't want to steal, rob, cheat, or defraud. There will be no avarice in his heart because he realizes that whatever he can claim and feel to be true, the Spirit will give it to him. Theologians talk about God. Instead of teaching men and women how to experience God in their own hearts, there are many good, kind, religious people. They follow all the tenets, rules, and regulations of their churches. They are conventionally good. But like Job, they suffer miserably, and hospitals and mental institutions are full of so-called good people who believe in personal saviors and so on. You are your own savior. You answer your own prayer. Because whatever you impress in your subconscious is expressed as form, function, experience, and event. Of course you answer your own prayer. A man who doesn't know that is living in the dark ages. He's a medievalist in his thinking. He's living in the jungle. From an external standpoint, it is true that these so-called good people follow the liturgies and standards of their religious beliefs. But the law of mind is, as a man think it in his heart or subconscious, so is he, so does he act. So does he experience, so does he become. It is the deep-seated belief in your subconscious that is made manifest. What you really believe in your heart is what you experience. 
If you work very hard and you believe in failure, you'll fail. You might be very good. You may be kind to the poor, visit hospitals and tithe and do all these things. But it's what you believe in your heart that is made manifest. Not what you give theoretical assent to. It is not your nominal belief. But it is belief in the heart that matters. It's your emotional espousals that are made manifest. For example, a person may go to church every day and receive sacraments and expect reverses or fears the flu or fears some sickness or fears failure. All these things will be experienced by him. For the law of the Lord is perfect and you can't think negatively and experience constructively and harmoniously. Many people may get 100% in their philosophical examination, yet their lives are chaotic. They can quote Plato and Aristotle and Emerson. They take Emerson in school as literature. If you follow the ideas of Emerson, you'd be walking in the light. You'd be walking along the shores of reality. You'd experience the moment that lasts forever. Emerson said, man is what he thinks all day long. If your soul is erect, he said, all goes well, meaning if you exalt God in the midst of you. And he called it the great oversoul within. The ideas of these philosophical ideas, you see, are not assimilated, appropriated, digested, or incorporated in their subconscious mind. Head knowledge is not heart knowledge. Science, philosophy, and religion are necessary. Each is doing good in its own way. But don't forget to embrace them all under the banner of the presence of God in you, the almighty power. An Air Force captain who has recently returned from Vietnam told me that he parachuted out of his plane in Vietnam, found himself in the jungle, he dressed his own wounds, he had medical knowledge, being a doctor, he had knowledge of science, and he studied the philosophies of the world. He also belonged to a nominal religious uh, belief. But he said, that a few weeks previously, he had been reading some unity literature sent to him by his sister from Los Angeles. And he began to pray as follows. He said, I know God our spirit is within me. It is all right and is leading me to safety now. He said, I knew that infinite intelligence would respond. I knew of its responsiveness and susceptibility because of reading New Thought Literature. A few minutes later, he said, my brother appeared to me and said, I will order the medics to come for you. They will be here in a half an hour. In a half an hour, the medics came on the scene and rescued him. He asked them, how did you know I was here? They explained that an officer appeared and gave them exact instruction. And he said, describe him. And they did. And the description fitted his brother exactly. His brother was killed in action a year previously. This is the fourth way. The answer comes in ways you know not of. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You could call that uh, a thought form, which is a capacity to speak, or some people would say it was a fourth dimensional being. But anyhow, he was capable of giving direction. And he said, I was not asleep. I was consciously aware. And I heard the voice. And it was all real. That has happened more than once. So the ways are past finding out. Now this doctor's science, philosophy, and his nominal religious belief could not rescue him. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty has given him life. And he experienced it. You can't take away that experience from him. He tasted the Lord and found him good. So these truths, you see, were incorporated in his soul. In the book of Daniel, it says, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. That's in the sixth chapter of Daniel. The story of Daniel is the story of all men everywhere. It is a story about you. It is said that Daniel, while in the lion's den, turned his back on the beast and turned towards the light within. The lions were powerless to hurt him. 
Understanding this drama enables you to extricate yourself from that acute problem in your life. I remember a soldier telling me that bullets were uh, all around him, coming in all directions. And he said, the only thing I could remember, he said, was the prayer on my mother's knee. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I didn't even know the meaning of it, he said. But I had a few verses. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. These few words he remembered, and in his extremity he turned to this power. And all of a sudden lightning came, and a terrific flood. Yes, terrific storm. The rain came down in torrents, and the bullet ceased to be found his way to safety. There was an answer, a response from an infinite intelligence. Remember, Daniel, as yourself, when faced with a threatening situation, he turned his back on the lions and he looked for a solution, a way out, through the power of the Almighty within him. Many people, when they have a problem, they look at the problem, they argue about it, talk about it, they magnify it. They magnify it exceedingly in their life, and it engulfs them. Turn away, like Daniel, from your problem. Contemplate the solution through the power of the Almighty. Focus your attention upon it. And uh, as you do, the power of the Almighty will respond. The lines in the Bible, as mentioned here, and in the 91st Psalm, represent seemingly insoluble situations of a threatening nature. In every problem lies the solution. In every question there is an answer. Turn away from the problem. Focus your attention on the solution. By claiming and feeling the reality of your desire, Continue in this belief, knowing that an almighty power is moving in your behalf. None shall stay his hand and say unto him, What doest thou? The realization of your desire is like dropping a seed into the prepared soil in your garden. Your desire for freedom from your problem is the seed you deposit in your subconscious mind, confident that it shall appear in its full-blown potential as all seeds grow after their kind. Do not worry or be anxious about the way the answer comes, as the ways of your subconscious are past finding out. Your consciousness or awareness is the only presence and power, the eternal cause of all creation. Create a new heaven, a new mental attitude, and a new earth will appear. For remember, God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And you dwell in the secret place, you abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and you'll say of the Lord, he's your refuge, your fortress, my God, in him will you trust. He covers you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you rest, and the truth of God shall be your shield and also your buckler. And because you set his love upon, upon you, he will prepare a place for you in the homeland of eternity and guide you to safety. Remember these words, they're fourth dimensional words. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me, thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, now and forevermore. They said the Most High, where you abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So he said, This is heaven. Heaven is your mind at peace. Our Father, which art at heaven. Heaven is that invisible intelligence in which you live and move and have your being. When I see you lift a chair, I see the unseen power. That's God. The thought is God too because your thought is creative. The word was God. The word is the Logos. It's creative. Um, so uh, he uh, realized, of course, that heaven is within himself. The most important thing in living was to reach out and touch perfection and that which they most loved to do, and that was to fly. The next dimension, you know, he says, we are practicing advanced aeronautics. Well, of course, that's what you do in the next dimension. You move from octave to octave, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, for there is no end to the glory which is man. Learn to play Lock Brahmanus Prelude here, and then you'll be better able to play to the next dimension. He points out here, for example, uh, he intimates that, for example, Edison, well, he's learning higher dimensions of electronics in the next dimension of life. Of course he is. Life is growth. You can't be less tomorrow than you are today. Life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. Life is progression, an endless unfoldment towards the real. 
Never in eternity could you exhaust the glory and the beauties that are within you. That's how wonderful you are, for you're the infinities within you. We choose our next world through what we learn in this one, true. What are you learning here? Learn everything you can about the treasures of heaven, the truths of God, and the great eternal truth. So that's all you can take with you. Some people think they can take the bank account with them. You can't. Uh, but you can take your knowledge, the treasures of heaven in your own mind, where moth and rust do not consume, where thieves cannot break through and steal. Take your knowledge of God. Take divine love with you, faith and confidence. And you'll meet loved ones, of course, because when you came into this world, you were met by loving hands. When you go into the next dimension, your loved ones meet you too. What's true on one plane is true on all planes, and that's what he's pointing out here. He's a great mystic, this Jonathan Livingston Siegel. You ought to read the book. Yes, um, uh, the loved ones are all around you. He said, you didn't have to go through a thousand lives to reach this one. No, because God is within you. And uh, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today, not tomorrow, because you're dealing with a timeless, spaceless being within you. There's no sense of duration in your mind. You go to sleep every night. That's where you go when men in their ignorance call you dead. You're in the fourth dimension. You go there every night and there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, sometimes at the hospital, a uh, man is about to pass on. He said, John is here, Mary is here. They're talking to him. He's not drugged either. He's quite rational, conducting a vigorous conversation with me. And a few days later, they discover that John had, had passed on in India or somewhere else, and he was right there talking to his father. Loved ones know you're coming. The elder smiled in the moonlight. He said, you're learning. He said, Jonathan, yes, he said. What happens from here? Where are we going? Is there no such place as heaven? No, Jonathan, there is no such place. Heaven is not a place. It's not a time. Heaven is being perfect. He was silent for a moment. You're a very fast flyer, he said. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're in heaven now. Heaven is your own mind at peace, the spirit within you, Father, which art in heaven. The Father, of course, is the spirit, the Father of all, the common progenitor. Heavens, aren't these things simple? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not low here, low there. For the kingdom of God is within you. He said, any number is a limit. Perfection doesn't have any limit. Perfect speed, my son, is being there. So now he's telling you in the next dimension that whatever you think of, if you think of a loved one, you meet the person. If you want to be in Belgium or France or South Africa, there instantaneously because your mind is omnipresent. You're no longer limited by a three-dimensional body. Uh, you're a spirit now. When did you cease to become a spirit? So he points out, without warning, Chang, that's one of the visitors in the next dimension, the great gull, vanishes and appears at the water edge 50 feet away, all a flicker of a second. Then he vanished again and stood in the same millisecond. Here, Jonathan is telling you about the man who dematerializes and rematerializes. In other words, the uh, <clears throat> Troad brings that out too, that a man who's fully developed, initiated, who's illumined and inspired, and one with a self-originating spirit. Such a man uh, can go to the next dimension, live there for a while, can go to any planet, and uh, the uh, spirit within him, the all-wise, creating all things, will project the body, consonant with the dignity, the atmospheric pressure, and so forth of that particular planet. Then Troy says that the man moves along the people, he's dressed like an ordinary citizen, they don't notice anything different. And then he wants to be back in London or New York or anywhere there instantaneously. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, your body is waves of electrons anyhow, your body is waves of light. And, of course, at higher, at higher meditations, higher mystic visioning, it's possible for a man to dematerialize his body and reappear, disappear at will. <clears throat> the uh, Enoch found favor with God and he was translated, we're told. Uh, meaning, of course, he went... Uh, he went up into the heavens by, with a luminous body. Just like you take a piece of ice, you heat it, it becomes water, doesn't it? And then heat the water, becomes steam, which is invisible. And bring cold coils in, it condenses down again. Yuri Geller, you know, the famous uh, Israeli, who dematerialized the watch and rematerialized it again, also with metals and so forth, studied by the greatest scientists in the world, showing you that mind does all these things. That's what he's talking about. So you're on omnipresent. Your loved ones are all around you. He said you can go to any place and any time that you wish to go now in the next dimension. 
I've gone everywhere, he said, and every when I can think of. Uh, the gulls who scorn perfection for the sake of travel go nowhere. Those who put aside travel for the sake of perfection go anywhere, instantly. Yes, because the next dimension you see, you travel through thought only, wherever you want to be. You communicate through your thought. Uh, and, of course, spirit is omnipresent. I believe you have it now, you know, and you shall receive it for the reality, of course, of the thought image in your mind. Uh, so Chang spoke slowly, he said, uh, to fly as fast as thought to anywhere that is. You must begin by knowing that you already arrived. In other words, believe you have it now. Stop seeing yourself, he said, as trapped inside a limited body that, have a, that has a 42-inch wingspan. No. Everywhere at once, across space and time, you're omnipresent. Quindy, of course, you know, said, I have the ability to condense my identity and appear at a distance. And he did. He's in his own home, and he's a hundred miles away, ministering to uh, a woman. And she's entertaining a guest, and the guest said, Oh, there's a man ministering to you. Uh, she said, That's Dr. Quinby. And uh, that's a hundred miles away. Quinby was uh, realized he wasn't limited by his body or by his environment. He was a transcendental being, and of course he was there. Because man outside his body, haven't you read Professor Hart's work, and man outside his body? Uh, you can be sent outside of your body now. Your body's on a couch. You can go there consciously if you know how to do it, but you can be sent there by scientists. And you have visual, auditory, and tactile capacity. Oh, yes, you do. And who are you? Are you dead or something? No, you're John Jones. And you have a body, but it's a fourth-dimensional body, rarefied, attenuated. And it can go through closed doors, collapse time and space, and that's what Jonathan Livingston Siegel is talking about. He said, I am a perfect and limited girl. That's what you are. You're a, a son of the living God, heir to all of God's riches. You are a spirit. When did you cease to become a spirit? You are always a spirit. You're a spirit now. A billion years from now, a trillion years, you'll be a spirit somewhere. But that's who you are. Spirit was never born, will never die. Yes. When they could see again, Chang was gone. Chang had the capacity, you know, uh, to uh, collapse time and space, reappear and disappear. Just like uh, many men in India have had that capacity down through the ages and in Tibet and other places. <clears throat> There's a Dr. Lear. He's a physicist. He's now working on an instrument, I understand, that uh, will convey the, uh, the electrons of your body. In other words, beam the electrons of your body to Amsterdam or wherever you want to go, and then they will coalesce in there because your mind and spirit are already there. But he would beam the electrons of your body because you're waves of light, you know. And all that's very interesting. But anyhow... Uh, we're going through a breakthrough here like Jonathan did. The gull sees farthest who flies the highest, he says. Jonathan uh, stayed and worked with the new birds. In other words, the birds coming into the next dimension, Jonathan helped them along, initiated. That's what happens to you when you go to the next dimension. Loved ones, nurses, doctors initiate you too. There are people loving and kind there. They minister to you initiate you into your new dimensions, and of course you learn there like you do here. The child's life who is snuffed out of the womb still grows and expands to the next dimension. And of course when you pass on, you meet that child, but it's fully grown because there are teachers there and love is universal. And that child is the great note in the grand symphony of all creation. And there is no death, friends. A child that was snuffed out in the womb still lives. It's a grace note in that grand symphony of all creation. And we're all heard, we're all kept together by that symphony of love. And Jesus, Moses, Elijah, Buddha, these are the great conductors that conduct us all into that symphony of love. The universal orchestra, celestial one. Uh, so God is the eternal now, he points out here. Fletcher was still young. That's another gull. And uh, they want to make him a god, you know. Well, he said, I'm not any different than any other gull. We're all, I'm an unlimited idea in the mind of the infinite gull, which means that you're a son of the living God right now. You're a daughter of the infinite, a child of eternity. <clears throat> uh, so he, uh, he said, don't be harsh, Fletcher. 
in casting you out the other gulls have only hurt themselves, and one day they will know this, and one day they will see what you see. Forgive them. To forgive all, you see, is to understand all. That's what he's pointing out. And therefore, love is simply seeing the divinity in the others. Not, as he says, it isn't loving the evil. It isn't loving a man because he beats his wife. It isn't loving him because he's cruel to his children. It is honoring the divinity in the man. The spirit in you talking to the spirit of the other and claiming what's true of the spirit is true of you. And it's true of him. And it's true of you too, because God indwells you. And therefore spirit with spirit shall meet. Salute the divinity in the other. And say, I see God in him and he sees God in me. And the love, the light and the glory of God flow through him. Then you're identifying. That's called love. Each of us is in truth, he said, an idea of the great gull, an unlimited idea of freedom. Yes, we call it being a son of the living God. Your body, he said, is simply a thought from beginning to end. Break the chains of your thought, and you break the chains of your body too. Your whole body from wingtip to wingtip, he said, is nothing more than your thought. God thinks, you know, worlds appear. God had to think of man for man to appear. Whatever God thinks is forever. And that's all your body is, and your love bodies to infinity. Uh, <clears throat> many of you have read the book Psychic Perception, where you deal with astro astral travel, fourth dimensional travel. Many people unconsciously leave their bodies at night, see events, and see events before they happen. They're able to describe things that are happening in a room, and all these wonderful things. These are powers that are within you. Job said, if a man dies, shall he live again? The question has been asked millions of times, for God is life. There is no end to the glory which is man. The body has a beginning, yes. Your body has an end, but there are you, there are your bodies to infinity. You'll always have a body. You can't even conceive of yourself without a body. And that'll be a four-dimensional body, a vehicle for expression of life. Death is the golden key that opens the palace of eternity. Uh, we mustn't think of death as an ending. We think of it as a beginning, a new birthday in God. So that's what you do. You rejoice in the birthday new birthday in God of your loved one who has passed on. And uh, <clears throat> there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we should also bear the image of the heavenly, you know. And uh, so there is no end to man's glory. There is no end to you, for life is self is growth, you know. Never in eternity could you exhaust the wonders and the glories that are within you. Uh, oh, Fletch, he says, you don't love. He does, says, you don't love the negative. You don't love hatred and evil. Of course you don't. You have to practice and see the real girl, the good, in everyone. In other words, you see God in your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your neighbor. The God indwells everybody. And to identify with that God presence, I call it forth. God's love, God's peace, God's harmony, God's joy. That's loving. You're not loving evil. That's absurd. When love comes in, everything unlike love goes out. Uh, <clears throat> look with your understanding. Find out what you already know, and you'll see the way to fly, now and forevermore. 